Heavenly Father, Lord, I'm so pleased that I'm here amongst brethren. Lord, I don't have to play church, Lord. I can allow my personality, Lord, to come out. I thank you, Lord, we don't have to be religious. We can be ourselves, Lord, and uh, some of us are serious, Lord, some of our happy disposition. Lord, it doesn't matter. We all make up the bride, Father. All we've got to do is be in unity, love one another passionately. Be willing to lay down our lives for the brethren, Lord, that's what you want. You made us so peculiar, Lord, distinct, individual, different, and I'm so glad, Lord, that I don't have to copy any preacher, I don't have to be anyone except Maurice Barrett. And Lord, I hardly know how you've made me, Lord, because our personality is spontaneous, Lord. You've made me free and I'm so grateful, Lord. I don't want to abuse it on the other hand. Give me grace tonight as we preach. Amen. Narrow line, isn't it? Being yourself or being so rigid that you, you can't be yourself because you're worried what people think. It's a narrow line. I'm not saying I've got it right. I, I... All right. So the universal judgment on Babylon. The one world system had come to a head. You always know it comes to a head when God judges it. He gives rabbit Babylon a long rope. God will let it go. And you say, why doesn't God step in? Why doesn't God step in? Because it's not reached the danger point. But each time you'll find it reaches the danger point. And here it had. And God saw the wickedness of man, Genesis 6, 5 to 6, was great in the earth. It's sad, isn't it? God was made in man's image. Uh, man was made in God's image. Man was made to love and worship God. And 1,500 years later, God saw the wickedness of man was great. In the, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, not every action, just his thought life was an abomination to God. It's, it's sad. It's pathetic, isn't it? Made in the very image of God. And yet every thought was a filthy, dirty, malicious, jealous, Possessive, judgmental thought, just like the world. You tell them something and they start laughing because they thought of a dirty meaning. To the pure, all things are pure. Adam was pure. He never had a dirty thought, a jealous thought, a judgmental thought in his life. But to the impure, everything's impure. They even turn good into bad. You say something and they think of a filthy meaning, don't they? They twist everything you say. That's the mind. The thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. This is one of the saddest verses in the Bible. It's so sad and poignant that Christians don't believe it. Because they've got the doctrines, you see. The doctrines are more important than God, aren't they? More important than what the Bible says. And it repented the Lord. God doesn't repent, Morris. Well, the Bible says it all the time. God repented, God repented, God repented. Have you never read your Bibles? God repented of all the evil he was going to do. Moses said, God, will you repent? Moses asked God to repent. Read it, Exodus 32. Christians don't know the Bibles. They know what the preacher tells them. The preachers don't know the Bibles. They pick out the proof text or what they've seen on God TV. Christians don't know the Bibles. Read Steve's book. He started to read the Bible without bias. Took off his doctrinal glasses and read the Bible. And he's written a book, Discovering the Real God. That was his journey. I've been doing it for 30 years, unlearning what the Babylon taught me. Takes a long time. You can leave Babylon, but to get Babylon out of you, goodness me. You can leave Egypt, but to get Egypt out of you, wow. Christians leave the world and they bring the world with them. It's in your heart. And it repented the Lord. So check your Bible, look at repent. God repented of the evil he was going to do when God, Moses asked him. And it repented, it meant he was sorry. Sorry is repentance, God was sorry. He was sad. He was disappointed. God can't be disappointed. Well, you don't know God. Anything you can feel, so can God. If you can feel anger, so can God. Anger isn't sin. As long as you're angry against evil and not the man next door. 
Jealousy is not wrong, it's because you love. God is a jealous God. It's which master runs the emotions, not the emotions, they're neutral. Anger, jealousy. If you can repent, so can God, because you're made in his image. And it repented the Lord, it made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Grief is a terrible thing. Ask a psychiatrist. Grief is the most single painful of human emotions. There's no greater pain emotionally than grief. A psychiatrist will tell you that. And it grieved God. Broken hearted. Why did I make man? God never expected man. God made the possibility of sin, but you don't know what it'll end up as. God didn't know that men would get so depraved that he'd have to say, I'm sorry I made man. One of the saddest verses in the Bible, but do you know the next verse? One of the most wonderful verses in the Bible. But no found grace in the eyes of God. It didn't matter that the whole planet were perverted. It didn't matter. One man is a majority with God. Don't worry, little flock. Big is not beautiful to God. Satan's maxim is big. Power, mass is beautiful. God says little is beautiful. Unless you come, become little, you can't become great in God's eyes. Nor found grace in the eyes of God. All right. That's just the opening scriptures. So I've shown that the good and bad seed will be with us throughout history. It started with Cain and the bad seed's still there. Manifest in the world, you can see it. Wars, false religion. The good seed is also there because there's always a remnant. There's a John Wesley. There's a Martin Luther. There's always people who say, ah, the remnant's still there, the good seed. What you need to know is the bad seed will always predominate and grow exponentially. And the good seed will always, always, always be in the minority and are often just a hidden remnant. Now, that's not debatable if you know world history and if you know church history. Babylon always becomes big and dominates. The whole world was dominated by the Babylon spirit before the flood. That's not debatable, is it? The whole world were in that worship system, the Tower of Babel. You see, if you don't know that, you'll try and make God's church the predominant one and you'll become political and you'll try and take the world for Jesus. That's Babylon. Shall I say that again? The church, the denomination that's tried to take the world for Jesus is Babylon because God calls a remnant and never tells them to dominate. What about Jesus coming, Morris? Devil's advocate, in case you're thinking it. Morris, what about God giving Adam dominion over the whole planet? Didn't he give him dominion? Yes, he did. And after the flood, what did he do? Same promise to Noah. Noah, subdue the earth, have dominion over it. The fish of the sea, the birds. He never told him to dominate man. He never said to Adam, dominate man. He says, have power and subdue the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, the animals over all my creation. He never told Adam to dominate men. Men were never meant to rule men. Men were meant to rule God's creation and God was supposed to dominate men. Men were never meant to rule men. God wanted to rule men and women. He wanted to be the king. But he said to Adam, you can have dominion over all the earth, never over men. Same to Noah, read it exactly the same. Noah, be fruitful, multiply. That's the first thing he said. Dominate the earth. The fish of the sea, the birds. He didn't say man to dominate man. That's God's job. That's witchcraft. If you're trying to dominate your wife, it's witchcraft. 
If a boss is trying to dominate his workers, if the pastor is dominating his church, it's called control and it's witchcraft. God wants to control people through relationship, okay? God will speak to you through a prophet, but he wants to be the king. That was the order. But you can't use that argument on me because I know my Bible. When God took e Israel out of Egypt and took them in the promised land, he never told them to dominate anything. He says, subdue the land, Israel. He gave them a small plot of land the size of Wales. And he never said, you must now branch out. This is Israel. This is God's people. That's your country. He never said branch out into Syria. He never said branch out to Egypt and Babylon. He never told them to branch out and dominate the world. He says, you are lights in the world, lights in the darkness. Don't try and take over the heathen. You're, if a heathen see that you're the light and you're God's favourites and they want to come in, allow them in. But don't proselyte the world. Be lights in the world. And he never gave them any command to take the world for God. Jehovah didn't say to Israel, look, you're my people, now you must Judaize the whole world. Did he say that? He gave them a small plot of land and that was the border. They could never get big unless they took over the world, could they? They had to stay small, didn't they? And never after that moment is there any commandment for God's people to be the predominant seed in the world. Jesus called the disciples little flock. Jesus never told us to take cities for Jesus. He never told us to win the world. The mandate is go into all the world and preach the gospel. Tell the whole world, every man, woman and child, we should all preach to the whole world. But then he said, those that be saved will be saved. Those that believe not will be damned. In other words, the results are not our business. The results are not our business. Our mandate is to tell the whole world. It never said save souls. Your Bible never says win souls. Did you know it? Did you know it never tells you to win souls? Never tells you to save people. It's not a sales drive. We're not want to be the dominant political party. We're God's remnant. Ever since he took them out of Egypt, they were God's remnant. The predominant seed from Israel coming out would always be the bad seed and God's seed would always be the remnant. If you don't know that, you'll get on the bandwagon and think you'll win the world for Jesus. Well, we, we took the country for Jesus 20 years ago. I remember Graham Kendrick marched for Jesus. We've taken the land for Jesus. We've been saying it since the Acts of the Apostles had never done it. And we never will because the mandate isn't to win the world. It's to preach to the world the gospel. We're witnesses of the truth, not politicians seeking to be the ruling party. No instructions. You can't. No instructions to redeem music and redeem the, the devil's system. We've no part in redemption of anything. Jesus does the redeeming. He'll redeem the whole world. You know, your cat, dog, and budgie will get redeemed one day. Read Galatians. The whole creation, the animal creature, is waiting for the manifestation of the sons, because the creature itself will be redeemed, along with your body. You've only got the first fruits. Your spirit, if you want to call your soul's been saved, but your body certainly hasn't, has it? My body's going to rot, the worms will eat me, I'll be fertiliser for next year's roses. But one day my body, my flesh, we are waiting to wait, that is, for the redemption of the body. And your cat and budgie have more faith than most Christians because they wait for the redemption according to the Bible. So our mandate from Jesus is to tell the world, not win the world. That's modern theology because Babylon wants to be big. So it's changed, tell the world, to take the world. Okay. You need to know that. Well, as history proved it, how many did God deliver out of Egypt? Two and a half million, three million, the people compute it. Some have said four million. Let's look at the lowest, two and a half million. It doesn't matter, does it? 600,000 fighting men, so they had women and children. You work it out for yourself. So we'll say two and a half million. God took them out to go in the promised land. How many got in? 
that came out? Two. Wow. Does that prove my point? Only two got in, Joshua and Caleb, and I even know their names. It was so small I can name every one that got in the promised land who came out of Egypt. Every single one out of two and a half million. Joshua and Caleb and Joshua and Caleb and Joshua and Caleb. There's only two. Now, that surely that speaks for itself. When God destroyed the whole planet, how many got through the flood? Eight. So the remnant went through, who was the majority. There could have been 15 billion on the planet at that time. They all drowned. The bad seed always predominates. It's not my theology. It's in your Bible. It's in history. Okay. How many came through the Catholic Church? It was, it was Martin Luther and a few others who stood against it. A remnant, they got thrown out. Martin uh, John Wesley stood against the Anglican Church. He got thrown out. Just a remnant started again. The remnant always come through, but the predominant seed is Babylon. When Jesus was born, he was born from the whore. Israel was still backslidden. Christians are deceived. They say, well, 1948, Israel went back. Hallelujah. Well, they've gone back in the flesh. By, the Bible says when they come back, they'll repent and God will restore them. Well, they've not repented, so God hasn't restored them. The Zionists, the political Zionists, have restored them. Have Israel repented? Are they a secular nation? Go on, go on get your atlas out and look at it. India, 90% Hindu. England, Christian. Israel, what does it say about Israel? Secular. That's how it describes it. It doesn't seem even religious. It says secular, they're a secular nation. It's a big gay community in Jerusalem, God's holy city. Have they repented? Have they turned back to God? Of course they have. They're still in the flesh. They're preparing for the Antichrist. They don't know it. The Zionists are the synagogue of Satan. They counterfeit Jews. They say they're Jews. They're not. They've taken it in the flesh. True Jews say that the Zionists are worse than Hitler. They say, Hitler destroyed our bodies in the gas chambers. You've destroyed our soul because you take back Israel before Messiah comes. He will restore us. Men won't restore Israel. The Zionists have not restored it. Anyway, I wasn't getting to that. So, two from the whole church. The New Testament's the same. So the church that's trying to win the world is part of Babylon. Listen, God's power... God's demonstration, God's might is best shown in humility. Pride comes in big packages, humility doesn't. God's power is best shown in humility, in meekness, in insufficiency and complete dependence on God's sovereignty. That's how God shows his power. Not through mighty men, not through bigness. Not, that's how God shows his power. God's power is best shown in weak vessels. That's what one translation said. So unless you become meek, insufficient, completely dependent on God's sovereignty, you might be big in the world's eyes, but you're small in God. You're part of Babylon if you're big. Popularity is pagan. Beware, watch out when all men speak well of you. That's what they spoke to the false prophets. Popularity means you're a false prophet, you're tittling their ears. Leap and dance for joy when they persecute you. Say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake because that's what they did to the true prophets. So popularity, there's something wrong. Jesus wasn't very popular, was he? Well, he was with the sinners. He wasn't with the church. He wasn't with God's people. God's people crucified him. Rome didn't crucify him. Rome said he's innocent. We're washing our hands. They said, oh, don't worry. Let his blood be upon us. God's people said, let his blood be on us. They cursed themselves. Do you know what God's people said? We'll kill God in the flesh and let his blood be upon us and our children. Oh my, what a curse. What a curse. The blood of killing Jesus was God's people and they said it's all right. How blind can God's people get? I'm amazed, you know, people are saying, oh, well, Jesus is coming soon. Listen, God's people missed his first coming and crucified him. Do you think people will miss his second coming? God's people missed it, didn't they? They couldn't see it. They were God's people and they killed him. And the church think they'll recognise the second coming. But they're still in Babylon and they're waiting for Jesus to come meek and mild, take over the planet. He's coming as a judge. There's going to be a, a military coup and the world's biggest bloodbath when Jesus comes. Have you never read about the Battle of Armageddon? Jesus came meek and mild the first time and they missed it. 
It's going to come as a judgment the second time and the church will miss it. The sign of the last days isn't great revival, it's great deception. Read what Jesus said. Don't listen to me or the preachers. Read your Bibles, for God's sake. Matthew 24, 25. There'll be a great falling away. It's all about God's people. The world can't fall away. They've nothing to fall from. They're already on the floor. So the you who've been lifted up can fall away. We're witnesses of the truth, aren't we? So, I believe the first one world order was before the flood. Because part of the spirit of Babylon is wickedness, violence. It takes over all humanity except for one man and his family. Don't you think that's astonishing? I'm quoting facts. If you believe the Bible, that's a fact. Ten generations from now, the bad seed with its domination spirit had taken over all humanity and it could have been at the same population as now except for one man and his family. And even his family weren't righteous. Otherwise, how do you get the bad seed carried through? How manifested the bad seed? It said Noah was a righteous man. It never said his family were. But you and your household, he got his family through. Got the bad seed carried on. Don't you think that's amazing? I'm trying to bring facts from the Bible and history to prove what I'm saying is right. I believe that the ancient civilization before the flood was more advanced than we are now. That sounds outrageous. I admit that sounds outrageous. I'll concede that. I don't think it is, but it sounds it. I believe they knew about DNA. I've said, I've looked up some of the pagan things for 4,000 years old, and they've got pictures of DNA on their idols, the double helix. The pyramids, we still don't know the mathematics of how they lined up the pyramids with the planets. Did you know they lined up with the stars? They still don't know how they did it, how they got the stones there. They still don't know. You probably don't know much about ancient civilizations. You should do a bit of homework. Easter Island, you know those big ugly statues? Hundreds, some of them thousands of tons. How did they get them there? Nobody knows. The natives say they came from another planet. The gods brought them. There's some amazing things if you look at ancient civilizations. That's why they're looking for Atlantis. They, I believe they were far more advanced than you ever, ever believed. Listen, if God destroyed the whole planet, they were pretty advanced. They were getting near to producing what we're getting near to producing. Don't forget, God's not destroyed the planet by fire, has he yet? So they were more advanced. They were nearer getting God men than we are. And we're pretty close with DNA. Think about it. If the devil said to Eve 46 words, the chromosomes for life, the devil knew something, didn't he? I could bring more facts, but I'm just that was just to whet your appetite for the next conferences. The devil knows, and he promised Eve immortality. Anyway. We're just discovering now nonlinear energy. Do you know what nonlinear energy is? Do you know the heart transmitters that can cause holes in the atmosphere to make tsunamis? I believe the tsunami in Japan was a man-made one. They can put holes in the atmosphere. They can bounce things off the stratosphere, the ionosphere. Do you know with these heart transmitters, they can pinpoint a whole town and put thoughts in your mind? Did you know? They're now capable of making you think what they want. The devil could put thoughts in your mind. Do you fancy that woman? I'd like that. The devil could put covetous thoughts in my mind, can't he? We now have the science to target the frequencies, microwaves. I'll go into it in the last study, so just whet your appetite. And those transmitters, when you look at it, there's one in Alaska. Russia have one as well. And when you look at this heart, this powerful thing, billions of megawatts, right? Or should I say a megawatt, billions of watts. 
You think, how can that generate? This is just a load of mass. Just an array of 48 mass. How could it do that? Nonlinear energy. It multiplies the frequencies. It builds up. So with a little voltage, you can get billions. I'll give you an example, just so you know I'm not a nutcase, all right? Because you'll believe this. If I get some dominoes from here to the door there, right? You, you know about dominoes. And I touch the first one. All right, we're talking physics now. It takes 10, kilo, 10 kilograms of, of knock, all right? Tell like 10 kilograms weight to knock the first one, we'll say. The next one, the next one, the next one. So they all fall down, don't they? Because I don't need 10 kilograms for the second one because gravity, when I hit 10 kilograms, the gravity of the first one, I'm using now science to multiply. I've used 10 grams of energy. It knocks the first domino. Gravity pulling it to the floor, which is gravity. That's the energy that pulls it. Will knock the next one and the next one and the next one. And 10 grams can knock a 1,000 dominoes over. I don't say each domino will take 10 grams, so I better have a massive weight and smash them. No, I can use science, nonlinear energy, and hit it. All right. I've got a domino. It's that size, isn't it? If I make the next domino half an inch bigger, and the next one half an inch bigger than that, and the next one half an inch bigger than that, I still only need 10 kilograms for the first domino. If I put dominoes from here to the Eiffel Tower, 10 kilograms will smash flat the Eiffel Tower. Because the last one will be 5 million tons and 1,000 feet tall. And all I've done is 10 kilograms. And gravity has multiplied and multiplied. In other words, it's not linear, non -li it's not linear energy that goes along like that. It's an exponential curve. Ray... Kurzweil talks about knowledge increasing exponentially. We're into the age where I can multiply the energy and do amazing things. It seems like these ancient civilizations understood. And else, how did they get thousands of tons up in the air? They had techniques we're just learning. All right, does that make sense about the dominoes? I could smash down the Eiffel Tower. Theoretically, if I could make bigger dominoes, and gravity would multiply the 10 grams to actually be... What would it take to knock the Eiffel Tower down? A million ton weight? I could turn 10 grams into a million tons. And I did nothing. This is what we're learning now. We can shake the world off its axis. That's what the harp does. Look, check it out. H-A-A-P. Check out the, the harp transmitters, what they're doing now. Scary. I'll give you some books if you're interested. No, I won't. I want to keep them, and then I'll tell you the titles. Anyway, ley lines and those things are not just hocus-pocus, you know. Power lines, they used energy. Anyway, I've said enough. But I believe they had amazing technology, so much that God said, we better stop it. It's gone too far now, and God destroyed the whole planet so it must have been bad. If you think the world's bad now, it must have been worse because God's not destroyed it. Okay, I'll say no more. God's not disturbed when these things happen because he always has a remnant. God's always had a remnant. And they always survived the judgment. Nor and his family, eight survived the flood. Genesis 7, 1. You know it, but let's look at the scripture. And the Lord said to Noah, come you in all your house, for you have I seen righteous. I don't believe his children were. I believe there was one man, but him and his household went through. How long did it take? I estimated before and said 1,500 years. I did some maths. The Jewish historian, Flavius Josephus, you've heard of Josephus, haven't you? Okay. Well, he, he wrote all the, you know, Jewish history. And his manuscripts calculated Noah's flood was 1,556 years after creation. Well, if you've got your authorised version and add them up, it comes to 1,656. 100 years different, so it's, they agree, don't they, roughly? So this is from the King James. 
And a man sat when he was 130 years old. I used to ask the question, I wonder how, Adam, how long Adam lived before he sinned. Because Adam was eating the tree of life, so he could have lived a billion, couldn't he? I thought, well, he could have lived a long time, and maybe that's when the dinosaurs were, and that's when... I was speculating. I thought Adam could have lived a long time. Never tells us when he sinned. But it wasn't a long time. Because he had Seth when he was 130, and Seth replaced Cain Abel. So we know it wasn't a long period. All right, just in case you... Maybe you don't think, I, I just think daft things, you know, and then God gives you a revelation. So he wasn't on the planet a thousand years before he sinned, was he? Couldn't have been a long time. All right, Seth began Enos when he was 105, 90. So if you add them all up, Noah was 600 years old, but it comes to 1,656. So that's how long it took for the world to get to the state where God said enough's enough. I've got to judge Babylon. That spirit dominates the world and God judged it. And I believe all the elements of Babylon were in that first world system. The whole thought patterns of mankind was dominated and seduced by mystery Babylon. And the manifestations couldn't be sealed. What's the manifestations? The murderous spirit. Genesis 6, 11 and 12. Next one, John 11 and 12. The earth also was corrupt. How can the earth be corrupt? It didn't say people, it says the earth. Do you know how the earth gets corrupted? I'll tell you. The blood of man. When blood goes into God's earth, God said it's corrupt. Cain? Where's your brother? He said, it's none of my business. Am I my brother's keeper? God says, well, I don't know. He said, but your brother, brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The blood speaketh. Every time a man's blood has been shed, because blood is the life of the flesh, it corrupts God's creation, and it's screaming out. The soul's under the altar. Revelation says, oh, Lord, how long? Do you not avenge the blood of all the martyrs? And God says, a little more time, a bit more blood to be spilled, a bit more corruption in the earth. That's what corrupts the earth. Every war is corrupting it a bit more, ready for Jesus to come again. It's all adding up the blood. Shed blood is an important part of the wickedness of Babylon. It sheds blood. Let's read it. Everyone that's ever been killed on this planet is because of Babylon. You don't believe that, I know. This is the whore, Babylon, and I saw the woman drunk. You've got to drink a lot to be drunk. Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. That seed of Babylon, every war, every murder is because somebody's got the seed of Babylon in them because it's a murderous spirit. Every ethnic cleansing, every war, Babylon, because it's murder. Every sexual perversion is Babylon. The devil wants to pervert God's order by murder, fornication, whatever. Another manifestation, sexual perversion. Not only man with animals, bestiality and those things, but it said angels left their realm to dwell on the earth, mate with the daughters of men. And this unholy union mixture produced Nephilim. The Bible says giants, but if you look at the Hebrew, it's Nephilim. That's the word, Nephilim, okay. We, we translate it as giants. Have you got the scripture, Joni? There were giants in the earth. Where did the giants come from? Did God create giants? No. If God didn't create giants, how can men my size produce giants? We're talking, a giant's like ten foot. We're not talking about a big man, six foot six, seven foot two. Goliath was ten foot, eleven foot, if you read it. We're talking about somebody double my size. All right, I'm not very big, but double my size, you know, you'd have to change the architecture and make doors bigger, wouldn't you? There were giants who produced them if God didn't. Answer me. 
doesn't happen. Don't say evolution, because that takes millions of years. We're talking about 1,500 years. Evolution can't like, work that fast to make six foot man, ten foot. can't work. There's not enough millions of years, is there? So if you don't believe me, tell me where they came from. The Bible said there were giants in the earth in those days. And after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, so they're not the sons of men going to the daughters of men, they're the sons of God. They bear children, which the same became mighty men, which were of all men of renown, men of wisdom, men of supernatural intrigue and wisdom and knowledge. They became mighty men. Why did they become mighty men? Because angels had mated with them. When it happens in the last days, you'll find there's people with superpowers. That's why we've got an epidemic, Superman. Iron Man, Spider-Man, all got superpowers, superheroes. He's prophesying. The Antichrist is probably a superhero. Rosemary's baby. How long have they been prophesying it? The devil had a baby through Rosemary. Do you remember? Sharon Tate got murdered who played in that film. Got sacrificed. Do you remember Rosemary's baby years ago? It was about a woman having a baby, having sex with the devil. That's what the film's about. We're talking about 25 years ago, I suppose. And the woman who acted it, Sharon Tate, got murdered by Charles Manson. Remember Charles Manson? Into the occult, witchcraft, heavy. And he went and had a witchcraft ritual and murder, and cut her up and witchcraft murder. So the, the devil's been prophesying it for a while. Jude confirms it. All right, this is New Testament now. Jude confirms it. And the angels which kept not their first estate, they left their first state. They left their own habitation. How can angels mate with women? Very easily. Well, I can mate with a woman. I know how it happens. When angels appeared, sometimes they appeared in the state they were created. Shining beads and people fell as dead. They also manifest as men and people didn't know they were angels. Came to Manoah and he said, do you want something to eat? He thought it was a visitor. And they looked after him and he said, do you want something to eat? He's an angel eating food, chips and hamburger. That's what it would have made him today, wouldn't they? Oh, or Lancashire hot pot. So he made him some food, normal food. The angel ate it. He didn't know it was an angel. And then this man disappeared in the flame. He said, it's an angel. Do you know what it says in the New Testament? Be careful that you entertain strangers. It's talking about people. Because many have entertained angels unaware. You've met an angel and you didn't know why. Because he appeared as a man. So if he can appear as a man... And you see his face and his head. I can imagine what he has under his clothes. If he appears as a man, can you? I don't have to take his shirt off to see if he's got a chest. I'm sure he has. So why won't he have sexual organs if he comes as a man? Would he look like a man and have a woman's organs down below? Think about it. He's appeared as a man, so he's got the eyes of a man, the ears of a man. Surely he's got the organs of a man. What, what do you think? Am I going too deep? Think about it. The angels which kept not their first estate, instead of appearing as a human, they decided to leave that estate and stay human. We want to be like men. They left their first estate, their own habitation, to dwell on earth and have children. It's reserved in everlasting change under darkness to the day of judgment. They're going to be judged for it, but they did it. Okay. And because of the wickedness of man, God tried to limit it. God always is trying to restrict Babylon. And so to help, because the whole world was dominated by the Babylons, God restricted man's lifestyle man, from up to a thousand years to 120. That's pretty drastic. And many of those old people lived to be 900, 600, 700. So that was the average age of men. 
So imagine living 900 years. What was the date 900 years ago? Now, what was it? Nine, what's, what date 900 years ago? Come on, math students. Take 900 off 2012, 900. So who was going about then? Genghis Khan? Attila the Hun, I don't know. You'd have been born then. You'd have been born in the Dark Ages and still living now. It's unbelievable to live that long. And God made a drastic restriction. He said, the wickedness is so bad. Babylon is manifesting so much. I'm going to help you by restricting your lifespan. Maybe it'll curb it. And God says, he'll only live to 120. He's cut it down to 70 now. That's not in the Bible. Man's days are 70. If you live longer, it's by the grace of God. Why did he do that? He's trying to restrict Babylon. He doesn't want to bring the judgment. He's hoping that men will seek God, but no, it dominates. It didn't work. He still had to destroy the whole planet. But can you see, God is always trying to restrict Babylon. And so God destroyed the whole planet. You have no idea what the planet was like when God created it, have you? I don't want, care what you think, it's all speculation. I believe there was only one landmass. That's just my speculation. He said he gathered the dry lands to one place and called it the earth, and the waters were called the seas. The earth didn't include the seas in Genesis. Gen uh, Genesis. We've later called the earth as the whole planet, but in the beginning, God didn't call the planet earth. He called the dry land earth and the waters he called seas. Later, the Bible called it one, but uh, you need to know how it started. And it would never be the same. Did you know it never rained? Well, tell me, geologists, geographists, what sort of a planet is that with no rain? Well, a mist came and watered the ground. Yeah, but, you know, what about the cycle of clouds? Was the clouds? Were the rivers? Yeah, there were rivers. But you see, the rain comes down, it goes into the rivers, it goes into the sea, and we've got evaporation. That cycle wasn't there before creation. Scientists have said there was a, a bubble around the earth. It was a temperate climate. You could walk around with no clothes on. You didn't need clothes to keep you warm. It was a wonderful, beautiful paradise. The wheat would go 10 feet tall, just like Texas. The tr there was no weeds. The fruit, the there was plenty of food for everyone. It, it, you have no idea what it was like. God changed the face of the whole planet, did you know? He didn't just flood it with water. He didn't say, I'll flood it. He said, I'll destroy the earth. Read it. I'll destroy it. I'll completely disfigure it. It won't be recognisable. There was a civilization before. That's why the occult are looking for Atlantis. They're trying to get back to the Garden of Eden. Where's the tree of life to live forever? So you have no idea what it was like, how advanced the civilization was. Atlantis is not just a myth. There were civilizations, but the whole earth was completely changed. Are you getting the picture? And this again, I believe, helped stop the spread of Babylon. Because after the flood, it's not taken 1,500 years to build up again, has it? How many years from the flood? 4,500 years to now. And he still not destroyed it. Do you know what God did? I believe after the flood, we got land separated. He separated people. Uh, Babylon, he spread them out and confused the language. But the first time, I believe, the flood came and it never went back to the same place. They say, geologists, that England was connected to France at one time. They call it the continental shelf. Do you remember that from school? Do you know it's very shallow, the English Channel? And they say, once, you know, one time it was part of Europe, but it's now flooded. Did you know there's mountains under the sea? They may have been dry land at one. There's civilizations under the sea. 
The whole planet's been defaced. You've no idea what it was like. Very advanced, I believe. But after the flood and now physical land masses were separated, it's restricting Babylon. You'll see at the Tower of Babel, they were all in one place with one language. This could never happen again. God realised that he made plans that if anything happened again, he'd separate the land mass out. Because it took thousands of years for us to get to America, for us to get to Australia. Do you understand? God's trying to restrict it, and instead of 1,500 years, and God said, I've got to destroy the planet, four and a half thousand years later, we're only just getting near to it. But it's because of Babylon. Revelation, Jesus won't come till he's destroyed Babylon. Come out, he's going to destroy it. That's the message. So it's come out of her by people. When Babylon falls, Jesus comes. It's not destroyed after, it's destroyed before, read Revelation. All right. That's the study finished. Let's have a little break. And I'm going to leave the Tower of Babel. How long did it take before God confused the languages? How long do you think it was from nor after the flood? We start again, don't we? Be fruitful, be multiplied. It's back to Adam again. You've got a new start. The planet's been cleaned, washed free. All Babylon's been drowned. You've got a new start. How long do you think it was before God had to destroy Babylon again? You'll get a shock tomorrow morning if you come. Okay. Let's have a break there.